biggest lesson for me is one, everyone says this, but really, really think twice about, do you need to raise the capital? If you're raising it, what are you raising it for? Do you need the strategic partnerships or do you need the capital to stay alive? Uh, if it's going to rocket fuel scale, like how is it like have the plan in advance, which most people do, but then when you put it into practice, that's a whole different thing. And then the other thing is to remember that even when you bring on partners, you are still the leader of the company to not lose sight of that. Joe and Yuha from WinCode, thank you guys so much for being here. You guys are two of my favorite people and I always appreciate you guys spending some time. So thank you for coming in. Thank you. Um, want to talk about WinCode. Want to talk about uh, you know your background, how WinCode got started. At, for the viewers and listeners that don't know, WinCode is the premier South Florida coding school. Do you call it a school or a boot camp? We call it a school, a boot camp, an academy, yep. a place where people come to reinvent their careers and in turn their lives. Amazing. Well, mm. All the things. Yeah. Not just coding, digital design, UX, yes. UI as well. So, yeah. No, yeah. The, the whole gamut, right? Whole um, gamut. I have great experiences working with you guys, you know, on multiple fronts, whether it's collaborating with you on stuff and speaking to your, your cohorts or hiring at a win code. I mean, Every time I hear wind code, I get like the, you know, the warm and fuzzies, Aww. you know, so thank well, you. We get warm and fuzzies when we see and hear things of you as well. I appreciate so that's that. Great. I appreciate that. Thank you. thank you for the support. Yeah, for sure. Always, always. Um, so I want to talk about your background, uh, how wind code got started. And then obviously like to talk about some of your learnings as you built this amazing company. Uh, but first let's start at the beginning. How, how'd you guys first meet? Cause you know, you're husband and wife, but you're also business partners, right? <laughs> so how did you guys first meet? And then let's take it all the way up to uh, how we started WinCode. Um, number one teammates. Yeah. So happy. And, uh, it's a great question cause we're celebrating our 21 year anniversary Amazing. tomorrow. Amazing. Happy anniversary. Thank, Thank you. you. We, uh, our team was asking us today. They were like, so you don't, we don't celebrate our wedding anniversary. Really? We kind of do. This is our dating anniversary that okay. we celebrate. And they were like, well, how do you know the exact day? Cause dating's complicated. You mm -hmm, know, like true. you don't really know like the first, when did you make it official? Yep. And I was like, well, I started dating you when I was 15. So that was like back in the day where you would like send a message and you're like, so are we, are you like my right. boyfriend now? Are we official? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember that. I, maybe that still happens. I don't know. So yeah, November 28th. Wow. So we met way back when we were in high school in in Helsinki, Finland, mm. or originally from Finland. You were in, in the same school. It was uh, it was small circles in, yeah. in Helsinki. So there were three schools that taught in English. Yeah. And I had actually grown up here in Florida. I was here from kindergarten to fourth grade. Uh -huh. And when I moved back, my parents enrolled me in English speaking program. And, mm. and Joe had similar stories. She's born in Toronto. Mm. So she was in one of the the other English speaking programs, but it didn't take too long for us to meet up and, and uh, get to know each other. And, and actually the school that you went to was located in the same building that we used to be in. So it was all, all really small. Very cool. Do you remember like how, how it got started officially? Was it a, was it like, <laughs> are, are we dating? Do you, do you remember? What was that moment? I remember when we first met, I think you and I are very similar. And so when I first met him, it was like competitive. I was like, who does this guy think he is? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but that, that sentiment faded very quickly. Yeah, that's awesome. And you always likes to tell everyone that I was the first one to call him after, you know, that those famed high school parties where mm. you like call someone the next day. Yeah. I was I, just calling, like I was pretty, <laughs> sure. I was just calling to make sure he got home. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's a fact. She's concerned. <laughs> I know. Sure. Yeah. I just remember that you called, I think at like eight or nine in the morning. I'd just gotten home an hour before that. Cause I had stayed out the whole night. I'm like, I need to call you back. I need to, I need to get a couple hours of sleep here, but I love that. Yeah, that's funny. As a potential future wife, that's the signal that you're looking for, right? That she made sure you're all right. Exactly. You're good to go. I love that. And I, and I like the fact that you're celebrating your anniversary on the day that you guys started, you mm -hmm. know, actually being a couple versus the wedding. I mm -hmm. think that actually is more important. You know, that's like the, the moment where your lives kind of diverged and led yeah. you down this path. Right. Yeah. So I like that. Yeah. And it, it's great. I mean, this is not a relationship talk, but I, I will say I, you know, we've had a lot of friends and we've seen relationships last and not last. And I think it's just like, it's so true that like old saying you either grow together or you grow apart. Yep. And I'm really fortunate to have a partner in all things in life who wants to like go after things in the same way that I do and who likes an agenda on vacation and 
likes a new challenge. Some, you know, everyone is different. So you got to find your like, you know, you got to find your lobster. Absolutely. And uh, I did. Love that. Love that. <laughs> I always admire the way you guys work together and how you built this company. So kudos to you both. Yeah. Um, your background's really quick before you got started with WinCode. Uh, Joe, we'll start with you. You were you're working at the NHL, right? Before you started. Yeah. So um, I went, so almost right out of university, my best friend, you know, We'll talk a little bit about this, but it's so important who you know in your network. Of course. Um, I met my bestest friends in university, but um, also got some amazing career opportunities from it. My best friend, her dad did some business with a, one of the executive VPs of the NHL, and she got an opportunity there. And we had been working together in project management before that. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so she left that job, went to join the NHL. I was like, oh my God, wow, you're so cool. I'm not that cool. And then she ended up getting me an interview there which our previous boss who we worked with before, he was like, man, I really need to add non-solicitation clause into mm. my agreements. But we laughed. I mean, we were so junior. He wasn't being serious. And so then I joined the NHL and I kid you not, I joined as an assistant and my, the boss I had there, uh, his name's Stephen Walcom. He's still there. He's an executive VP and he's awesome. He used to be a ref on the ice. Uh, awesome character, great business person, awesome strategic mind. He, they had a lot of, demand for the role obviously as you can imagine hockey is like religion in Canada yep. and uh I was like you know looking back you're always like do not do that don't ever do that so he asked me why do you want this job I was like well I I just graduated university I'm really hard working I think I can handle this job I just want you to know I'll probably only be here a year because this is this X, Y, and Z was what I really want to do mm -hmm. and he just started laughing and he was like you know he was kind of like, I'll have the last laugh. And sure enough, he did because I was there for 10 years. Wow. You gave him a challenge right from the get-go. You're like, I'll be here for a year. And I think you set Don't the Don't ever framework. say that, though, in the first yeah. interview. Yeah. I don't know what I was thinking. He found it very amusing. He, he laughed. He's like, I like you. And I was like, okay. That's a good tactic in an interview. I like that. I like that. What was the position again? Um, so I started as, as an assistant, but I yeah. left as a senior manager. Mm -hmm. So I was the first female in management for hockey operations officiating. Left as the highest ranking female on the team. Amazing. And uh, that was awesome. Worked with 85 guys on the team. Really cool. I mean, it's so glamorous to be in sports. There's definitely the unglamorous parts, sure. but I worked with a lot of characters. I learned a lot. I got a lot of great mentorship. Was really fortunate for that. And I mean, I had a, had a blast. Like, you know, you work hard, play hard when you're in sports. Mm -hmm. So it was awesome. Um, but I also really you know my father i grew up in an entrepreneurial household i really loved working with you ha i really wanted to do something where i could be the ultimate lead on something mm -hmm. so i'm really happy it led me to entrepreneurship but sure. that part of my story is not super important just because of the sheer duration like 10 years mm -hmm. but because it really did have such a positive impact for me amazing you ha your quick background that led into woodcode yeah so i, I going through kind of college um yep. in in toronto I always like realized very quickly I was entrepreneurial. I had little startups even as a kid in, in middle school. I was buying matchbox cars on vacation in Florida and nice. selling them to all the, You're flipping the them. yeah, to the Russian kids who Love had more that. money and couldn't <laughs> couldn't buy them in, in Helsinki. So fill suitcases of those things. But um but going through college it was um interesting because I was on a visa in, in Toronto and in Canada and one of the things you had to do was get a job within a certain amount of time. And if I remember right, it was like either three months or six months. So it was a really short amount of time and for that reason, I like really tried in school for like the last few months. I was like, okay, I can pull this whole thing together and ended up graduating like, you know, close to the top of the class doing really well and getting no job offers. It was very humbling. And to this day, I remember that how awful the job search looks. And we relate to that a lot with our graduates because it's hard. I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're in one of maybe the toughest times of your life. And I ended up getting a job selling recipe booklets. So what we would do is call different food brands and try to get them to sponsor us to make a recipe mm -hmm. with their products. Cool. And, uh, it was really literally the only opportunity that would let me stay in the country. So, uh, I was very grateful for it. It taught me a lot of sales skills and a lot of things that I use today. And then I ended up working in the toy industry for a while at, at Spin Master, which was a really awesome success story. I mean, one of the largest toy companies in the world now, and there maybe 300 people when I was there. So just seeing that firsthand and how leadership can kind of shape a company and also like you know, great ideas and moving quickly. That company quickly. was founder led. Founder led. And yeah. also like they iterated very quickly on what they were doing. Like they would try a product and if it worked great, if it didn't, it was on to the next, no hard feelings, yep. you know? And I think that was a really great lesson. And, um, the whole time I was kind of working on my own startup and, um, it was a sporting goods thing, a sport called floorball, which I'd mm -hmm. uh, grown up playing in Finland. 
And uh, I thought it was a slam dunk. I'm like, this is hockey. It's Canada. You know, everyone's going to love this game. And um, I didn't realize, but there are reasons that, you know, people don't start new sports from scratch right. and try to make money selling the equipment. <laughs> right. Nobody needs the equipment if they don't actually play the sport. So I ended up driving probably to over a thousand schools across Canada in my minivan uh, promoting the sport. I eventually left my toy job and uh, we got in, in a couple hundred retailers. We got promotion or, or kind of... Um, partnerships with Hockey Canada and USA Hockey met a lot of amazing people, but it was like the definition of a passion business, mm -hmm. you know, like there was no money. The team was really small, you know, we're in a warehouse and kind of a desolate corner of, you know, far outside of Toronto. I loved what I did, but I knew I had to reinvent myself, you know, and I put a lot of time, I mean, o over kind of 10 years into that project. And when I look back, it maybe didn't have like some of the hallmarks of success, like financially, definitely not, you know, we didn't get to the scale we wanted, but it taught me a lot of lessons that, you know, you couldn't do the next thing without putting in the time and, and sure. really learning those lessons the hard way. Priceless so, education. Exactly. And then talking about education, I thought, you know, for me to reinvent myself, like, mm -hmm. you know, already past 30 at that stage, I'm like, what do I do? Um, a friend of mine recommended code schools and that was something that at the time there were like maybe three or four across the country. It was really, really early. And, and the fact that they were very not established and kind of counterculture really appealed to me. I'm like, nice. great, this is all about results. And it's what, very different. What year was this? Uh, this would have been 2000, 2000, what do you think? 2013, yes, maybe. Yeah. yeah. 2012, 2013, when mm -hmm. I started looking into it and, uh, yeah, 2013 is well. yeah. Yeah. And, and technology really like appealed to me. I was running an e-commerce store for mm -hmm. the business and I had always been savvy, like, you know, tinkering in HTML and whatever else. Right. So I'm like, okay, I'll enroll. No idea of what I'll do, but maybe I'll transition to a tech startup somehow. And then every day, Joe and I would talk and debrief and be like, this is really an amazing type of education. People are getting a lot of value, but here's like a list of 10 ideas that could be better about the school. And every day that kept building up and we we're like, we need to, let's just make the leap and start this. So mm. um, the place I was going to was Bitmaker Labs, which mm. uh, was was very established in Toronto. And the founders were amazing. I told them the plan. I'm like, if you don't want me to be here, I'm happy to leave. And they were like, no, no, stay, get the full value and we'll give you advice and help you as long as you're in a different market from us. Mm. And that really helped set the stage for, you know, coming up with the concept of WinCode. That's awesome. And I'll quickly say, I mean, yeah. you mentioned, you had touched on quickly with, the floorball business and floorball pro that there were a lot of lessons learned. It's been, uh, I have benefited greatly from those lessons because we're partners. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really great that you had ha in, in most scenarios, he was able to bring in like, uh, especially in the beginning, we should worry about that. We shouldn't worry about this Definitely. because when you're starting, you have only have so much bandwidth. I mean, always, but when you're starting, the more, uh, laser focus, you can be on the priorities, the better the start will be. And, um, and so, you know, he had great experience on that side. I had great experience managing and rallying people behind a common goal from the NHL. So it was a really, really good, ex good, I think marriage mm. <laughs> pun intended. Yep. And, uh, I will also say like, it was like a funny thing. Like, you know, we all hate accounting. I mean, we love it, but we hate it. Right. And you was like, no, the first thing we need to do is like make sure account. We have a great bookkeeper. Yep. All the numbers are checked. Yep. And uh, that was just experience from Floorball Pro. And when we started raising capital, I know we're going to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Due diligence on the financial side was so much easier because everything was in order. You know, and one of those things is the longer you go where you're like, oh, I'll get to that later. Sure. Or I'll put it in, you know, the harder it gets. So sure. that I thought that was really it was really valuable and beneficial. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of founders think like, Oh, I'll save money there and I'll do it myself. And I did it one time like that. And it yeah. was a mess, yeah, you know, like QuickBooks so or whatever QuickBooks and you're trying to do it and you're yeah. trying to sell product. And then you're like trying to, you know, make invoices and then you're like trying to figure it out. Like, how do I do all of this? Yep. And before you know it, it's a mess. And now you're having to focus on something other than your business rather than if you set up those functions correctly at the beginning. For so. sure. And that's a great lesson that, you know, you need to understand what you shouldn't be focused on it's almost more important than what you yeah. are focused on yeah. right because you can overwhelm yourself real quick oh yeah and not just like things about getting the business off the ground but also emotionally for sure yeah like uh, i'd say that was really helpful in the yeah, beginning that was one of my biggest issues when i was running my company was i was i was emotionally overwhelmed yeah. with all the stress and i took every problem home with me mm -hmm. you know what i mean and i just couldn't 
I couldn't like I got addicted mm -hmm. to solving each worry. You know what I mean? Like you get, let's say you have a hundred worries in your head and you get addicted to, okay, well now I only have 99. Now yeah. 98, 97. <laughs> the problem is you wake up next morning, five more are on your plate, right? Uh, yeah. So now you're at 102, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's just like a never ending thing. Professional you, problem solver. Exactly. Yeah. But you get, that's kind of what turns us into workaholics. You get addicted to just trying to solve these issues, right? And it's not necessarily healthy long yeah. term. All right. So WinCode, that, this is how we got to WinCode, right? That's the inspiration behind it. You picked Miami as a market. How, what was that decision like? And what, how, how did Miami come about? I think Panther Coffee like laced their coffee with something is that and really? we got all like addicted <laughs> on Winwood. <laughs> that cold, is the cold very brew. much a part of the story yeah. actually. Because that's that's the first time I met you. Was at Panther Coffee with Ed. Yeah, yeah. You know, literally, that's I was awesome. getting a, a cup of coffee and Ed's in front of me with you, Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's probably Ed. the second interview with that or second day with him where I can't remember. Yeah. You know what's really funny about that day? So Ed is the first person yep. employed by WinCode in the history of WinCode and is still with our team today, and he's amazing. Um, and shout out to Ed. Shout, shout out, out to, to Ed. Ed Huge. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, he, you was like, oh, well, he, he just ordered coffees, like cold brews, mm -hmm. and they're sitting there meeting. I'm kind of telling her a story, but he, he actually didn't drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and he had drank the coffee because of the meeting. And he said he was like completely crazy. That's afterwards. dedication right there. <laughs> yeah. You wanted, you wanted the, the recruit, huh? <laughs> yeah. It was, it was very interesting. Yeah. He still tells me that story. You That's know? awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so yeah, Panther coffee again, lace the How coffee. Start, yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, Wynwood as a neighborhood, like I, it's still super inspirational, but I mean, at the time it was just very, very like you could tell something special was going to happen right. there. That anything was possible. Yeah. It was that, like that, a that time vibes. that was like mm -hmm. the beginning. There was a little bit of energy, but it wasn't quite what it is now, which exactly. is just like blown up yep. completely. Yeah. And, and we looked at other markets, you know, but I think there, there were a few things like one, we definitely want it to be in the U.S. We mm -hmm. thought, okay, this is this is a business better suited for a U.S. market. Yep. Um, coming from Finland, but having had the experience of living in Florida, didn't want to deal with winters anymore. We're like, okay, let's try to set ourselves up somewhere where we could enjoy life as well. If you have yep. free time, you can do something enjoyable. Um, so we looked at Austin, uh, we looked at Los Angeles, and then we looked at Miami. Nice. Um, and Miami was kind of on the list, honestly, only because my parents had a place an hour north. And uh -huh. we were like, okay, we're here anyway on vacation. Let's go check it out. And an artist uh, friend of ours uh, in based out of LA told us originally about Wynwood and was like, you got to go check it out. You love coffee. Go see this place, see what it's all about. So um, that was our initial kind of introduction to it. But I think the thing that really sold us on Miami was the people. So we, we did this thing where um, we just basically Googled every article about Miami Tech. And at the time, there weren't a lot. There was something about Live Ninja. There was something about Knight Foundation, mm -hmm. Endeavor, uh, uh, Venture Hive. Mm -hmm. You know, these are kind of the refresh Miami. Yep. These are the things that were existed. So we literally like highlighted the names of anybody that was mentioning these, these things. And we're like, we need to meet these people. Let's just call and see if they'll meet with us and tell us what the tech scene is really like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got meetings with everyone yeah. and it was just people were very enthusiastic. You know, they, they were very supportive and you could tell that there was kind of a mission. Everybody had their personal mission, but there was this mission for something bigger, right. you know, something that we could do together. And, and I think that was really appealing to us and it, it helped kind of convince us that this was the place. Right. Yeah. And even though that was six years ago, I would still say even today, it's one of the huge benefits, I think, of the South Florida ecosystem and Miami in particular. People are pretty accessible. You know, and, and in the bigger, more established markets, like it's hard to get a meeting. Um, people are busier or think they're more important For or whatever sure. it is. But the the caliber of people down here and what they've accomplished and what they want to do and that they have some bandwidth to support. I mean, it's really incredible. It is so cool. It is because you tell me you have a list. L.A., Austin and Miami. Yeah. Right. I mean, I would think that Miami's definitely third. Usually if you're yeah. looking for like tech opportunities, yeah. like I want to create a product for the tech scene. Miami is going to rank third there just because those markets are so mature. Yeah. But exactly what you just said, Miami is such a welcoming community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it, I mean, it still is, especially at those early days, though. Everybody was like, OK, it's a rising tide lifts all ships yeah. mentality. Yeah. How can we help? How can we get you involved? And I think that's, like you said, that's definitely what sets Miami apart still to this day, right? Everyone yeah. wants to help each other. Yeah, but and I love it. I think, like, it's so cool. Like, for us, we really wanted to be part of building something from as early as possible. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we were first movers in the market, but te it wasn't, tech is not here because of WinCode. We did yeah. join something, but it was still so 
early days, we really wanted to have a huge positive social impact, but also be part of building a community. Yuha and I had a long track record of that with like sports and sport events. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we liked doing that. Um, and I think Miami represented, although should maybe have been third on the list, it represented the biggest opportunity for the biggest impact. Definitely. And I really, you know, I say this like many times, but being in an ecosystem where the canvas still has white space is a huge positive because we have time to like build and mold it into, you know, awesome things. Like for example, a gender diverse tech ecosystem, like that's a lot easier to do somewhere where you're building rather than somewhere where you're trying to undo like, you know, heavy bias or something that's super established already. For sure. And I would say like the challenge of it is appealing too. you know, to realize like, okay, we're going to have a lot of work here, but yeah. if mm -hmm. we put in that work, we can have a really big impact where if you're going to Austin, there was already a code school there. You know, the tech scene was already pretty established. It's like maybe as a business, we could have been a lot more successful, but you know, it wouldn't have that same impact, you know, as, as doing something here. So I think that that challenge was really I think motivating for us. Yeah. And I'd say like we bootstrapped and we're self-funded for many years mm -hmm. and California is so appealing, right? Yeah. Like who doesn't want to go to California, right. but, uh, leases can also make or break course, companies. Yeah, like sure. it's like, it's like the simple things that actually end up undoing a business. And, um, you know, just the cost of doing business in California is so much higher yep. than it was here. Like there definitely is a benefit to, to launching here. So there's that, you know, cost of launching is much lower here. Um, and then I also just like this element of Miami. Like it feels like you, anything's possible. You can be anything you want to yeah. be if you just like put in the work. For sure. And, and I, 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 I like that. It's like a little bit like the wild west, but not entirely. Yeah. I mean, we're a city built on immigrants, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so like everybody, I don't know, it's got that, that welcoming that welcoming vibe, yeah. you know, and uh, I've always appreciated that about this city. And uh, what it, one last thing was, I, yeah. I think what was really smart at the time was Knight Foundation was already doing the startup focus, right. yeah. you know, right. and I think that made a big difference for us because not only was it them, but Endeavor had already uh, opened or was announced that they mm -hmm. were opening. And I think just seeing that kind of stuff, it didn't really, maybe it wasn't necessary in those other markets, but seeing that it was really awesome that there were people that were looking at just growing it, you yeah. know, like Knight didn't have any other motivation except let's just grow this thing, you know, and get good people the support that they need, you know, and the work that Matt started, Matt Hagman, you know, has just so much success has kind of come from that. And I think it was really cool to, to see that. And I, I think right now where we are, you know, as a tech ecosystem owes a lot to those kind of early days and the decisions as well as the startups, like yeah. what you started with Live Ninja and all these stories are, you know, really laid the groundwork for, for what Miami Tech is today. I want to talk about those early days at WinCode, right? I mean, we'll talk about how you guys scaled and that's super inspiring, but those early days where you had one cohort and Ed, right? Ed was the first hire, right? The first instructor. Mm -hmm. What was it like just starting that and recruiting like the first batch of students? Like you're new to the space, you're new to starting a, you know, an education company. How was that whole process just getting, getting going? I mean, it was really exciting, yeah. you know, like every day was uh, something new, you know, and I think for me personally, that beginning stage is actually the most exciting yeah, because so it's fun. just you're like, wow, if I do this instead of that, like it might change the whole path of what right. we're doing. And you know? are, the jumps are so huge at the huge. early at the early going. right? Yeah. And, and there, there's a story, you know, that that we tell the, the wind coders when we do like a little history thing is that the first cohort, actually the first two people signed up for cohort number two. Mm. And when they signed up, they didn't know that we didn't have the funding to make it to cohort two if cohort one didn't fill up, wow. you know? So wow. <laughs> we couldn't tell them that, but right, I remember the first guy who signed up, you know, I was at the gym and he called like really late at night. I picked up the phone and I tried every trick in the book to get him to switch to the first cohort, you know, and he just wouldn't take it. He's like, no, no, I need time to prepare. And I'm like, you're right. Those are all the right reasons. We'll see you in cohort two. And inside I'm like, please don't let him down, you know, like make sure like, cause he was already quitting his job. I'm like, make sure we're around, you know, for the second cohort. And then pretty soon it just started happening. Like, you know, we had those two people for the next one and then you get one person and then two people, we ended up with 14 students, which was amazing for you know, cohort one. for cohort one. Amazing. Yeah. That so it was amazing. really like our, our goal was probably 10. I can't even remember what it was, but it was really great to kind of get started. And, um, it was, Ed and us, you know, basically any function that needed to be done, right. you know, was, was, was done by us. But I think the thing I thought of throughout, obviously started thinking then about cohort two, but it was really, how do we find placement for all of these people? And mm. 
we had never done technology placement. Like I had done a code school, but I'm not a developer. You know, I I didn't have a developer job and I didn't know how companies work. You know, what's the ecosystem really like down here? So we just tried to take as many meetings as possible, but no companies would commit. You know, they're like, well, let's see what your grads are able to do, you know? And so you're in this waiting game and it was really, I, I guess we were nervous, but also like just trying to do everything we could to set them up for success. And then pretty soon we looked back on, on that cohort. I think it was maybe two months after. So well before like midpoint of the next cohort mm-hmm. and everybody who wanted a job had one. Amazing. And we're just like, wow, this is yeah. really cool. So That's awesome. then you start figuring out, okay, what are the processes? Where can we start to improve? We need to hire some people to help us, you mm-hmm. know? And uh, it was really like those early days were a lot of fun. And I felt like there was a time where, you know, really if we were able to pick up the phone, we were finding good students, you know, it was really, that was all we needed to do, you know, yeah. now the space is a lot more complicated, but we've obviously grown with that and, and been able to find our own niche. For sure. I think we made t-shirts that were like zero to a hundred real quick. Yeah. I think those are. Drake yeah. still remains very <laughs> popular <laughs> among the wind fam. I would say for me, it was, you know, we, I used to run training camp for the refs and the linesmen. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge event with a big budget. And it was like a big week long thing to prepare for the season. Like every team does as well. And then you and I used to run an indoor hockey tournament that in the end ended up being televised was a thousand players was at old Maple Leaf gardens in Toronto. So also like intense. And so for me, I hope I'm not dissuading anyone from following their entrepreneurial <laughs> dreams. But for me, I feel like the first two years was like I was running a really like intense event. Well, that's know? what it's supposed to feel like. Yeah. Right? So it was like when you're running an event, you're like on all the time. Mm. You're up at all hours. You're like trying to like proactively right. solve in case there's issues. You're trying to have contingency plans. Right. You're talking to everyone. You're doing everything. You're also celebrating. You're living in Miami now. So you go out every now sure, and then. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it was like the first two years I was just I felt like I was on all the time and i loved it for the most part but then you know and i know you relate to this at some point you got to be like okay i also need to like make some friends Mm -hmm. who are not who are outside of like my work circle and also like to take a break right um and so you know you you learn that all with experience i wouldn't change anything about that but i will say that you know, just talking earlier about Yuha having the experience of his previous mm-hmm. startup, he he was also like, eventually, he's like, you know what, we should really like book some time off in advance because we need to, otherwise, if we do it last minute, we'll never do it. For and sure. That, you know, now we're kind of in a bad habit again, but uh, it ebbs and flows. Of course, yeah. of course. The event analogy is a good one, right? Because an, an event, you, it's chaos behind the scenes, but it always has to be picture perfect to the people attending exactly, the event. Exactly, so yeah. I, I like that analogy. Yeah. yeah. And and I would add, I mean, the biggest thing for me was having run another business for so long mm-hmm. and, you know, really not having a lot of success. You know, like right. we were able to will it into existence and right. I feel like we got people to, you know, follow. And, and the sport still exists today. The tournaments still run. It's really amazing. I mean, floorball's around in Canada because yeah. of some of the, the work that the people that, that we were able to find have, you know done and it's just it's really exciting but it was also just always a battle and i felt Mm -hmm. like with with wincode it was we were doing all the same things but we were providing a service that people were really looking for you know and it's interesting to see that difference you know we're like we're i felt as an entrepreneur like the exact same person but all of a sudden everyone's asking you like how did you do this like what a great success like and i'm like we did nothing different it's just a different product and a different industry and and that's when i see people who are not in tech I often really try to encourage them to be in tech somehow because I think it's the the industry itself, the whole vertical, like it's just so much more open to change. People are, you know, more likely to jump on board really quickly. The growth can be a lot faster. That brings other problems too. But I just think as an, an area, if you're going to focus into anything, focus there because the opportunities are so much better than in some of the more traditional fields. Right. Yeah, and I think taking charge of or, t- or hold, you know, really grabbing onto any opportunity in life like timing is definitely one of the key elements, oh, 100%. you know, and, and so I totally, yeah, agree. And that totally resonates. And yeah. And we felt like when we kind of decided we were going to do this, we felt really up against the clock where like we have to launch super quickly. So we literally set a somewhat Joe thought unrealistic date to launch of like three months after you know, thinking about this without visas. We're going to sell without, our place, get visas. I'm going to quit my job of 10 years mid-season. You're going to find someone to manage your operating business. 
So yeah, three months was and find the students. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I yeah. feel like the best things happen like that. The best things are like really quick acceleration. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you decide to do something, you have conviction, and you go for it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that's awesome. Um, there was no time for for self doubt, right? Yeah, yeah. Or second guessing. Yeah, it was just like, just we like we we're just going to do it. Very cool. Uh, so really quickly to to kind of bring us to where we are now, right? You, you started off with that one cohort. How many cohorts now has it been? So we're about to have cohort 35 in Amazing. Miami. And a cohort graduate. usually lasts 10 weeks. 10 10 weeks. weeks. Yeah, but we've had another like, was it 15, 15 in Fort Lauderdale and one, and one in, in Miami, Miami Beach? Beach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But we've have, we have close to 800 technology grads now, a mix of Amazing. web developers and product designers, so UX, UI. Sick. Uh, not counting our part-time programs. And uh, maintain a 93% job placement rate. Yeah, that in is super 2018. impressive. Majority of the four, close to 400 companies that have hired from the program, um, all in South Florida. So everyone's all, you know, the data is awesome. We're super proud of that work and also happy to be very transparent and have it all reviewed by yeah. a neutral third party. And our team's really proud of it. But it's also, I'm also really proud of it because anyone who's in a different market is always asking me, like, so what do you do? And they're like, oh, where do you do that? And I'm like, Miami. And they're like, Miami, really? Like, you can get educated and have a tech career in Miami? I was like, yeah, you can. Like, it's amazing. That's I think, awesome. I think uh, every we're going to see this happen in a lot of cities, mm. but I'm really happy to be doing it here. That's crazy. So how many students again, total? We have just over 760. Just over 760 and then 90, over that time, 93%. Placement. So for last year, 93. It's I think we've been between 90 and 94 every year. That's amazing. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, so. 2018 was 93%. So yeah. easily over 700 jobs you've placed, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And that includes some people are entrepreneurs. We've had a guy who started a company that's on the Inc. 5000 list. He's got over 50 employees. What? And it's, uh, What's the name of that company? Fusion, Fusion RL. RL. Yeah, wow. and it's a guy, Alex, and... Basically, he used his final project at WinCode to raise money for that project and then uh, hired his whole tech team as all WinCoders. That's and, awesome. And though the company is like kind of New Jersey based now, his whole tech team's down here because it's all WinCode people. So just cool to see those stories. And there's a lot of smaller examples too. For but sure. Alpha cool. Tech Blocks also, like a, uh, the founder is WinCode educated, started it. Uh, her whole tech team is WinCoders. They're doing awesome stuff too. There, there's, a, there's a few companies that are are awesome. That's awesome. Entrepreneurial alumni. Amazing. I mean, for me personally, like when I'm done with my day and I think I lay my head on the pillow, like what makes me satisfied of how I spend my day is how many people I've impacted positively mm-hmm. with my day. I mean, you guys, you're, you're at a scale that's incredible, right? I mean, you're literally changing the lives of over 700 people when you think about it. Right. So I, I can imagine the level of satisfaction that you get from that. You it's, know? uh, no, I mean, it's amazing. We're so lucky, you know, like so lucky to be in the space and, and be so mission driven. And I will say that we have an amazing team. It definitely takes a village. Like mm, if somebody sure. wants to completely change their career uh, and go into technology, whether it's UX, UI or software development, that also requires a mind shift. Mm-hmm. And uh, it takes it takes an awesome team to do that. And so that's also when people are like, oh, I can't find any great people in Miami, I'm always like, really? Like, we find such amazing people here. Definitely. Yeah. I never bought into that sentiment that there's not a lot of talent in Miami. Yeah. You know, like funding and and talent are the two things that everybody identifies with as like the challenges. Talent's here. Funding's here. You just have to go look for it. Yeah. Right. And I think that's true of any place. You know, yeah. finding those things is for sure. is hard. You for know, sure. but that's of part of building a, a business. Exactly. You know? It's easy to pin it on the city and for be sure. like, oh, I couldn't find anybody good. You know, it's like the people are there. And in some ways, because that reputation exists mm-hmm. to find good people will be attracted to the good missions and the good companies yep. because they're also maybe struggling to find companies that look at that. So I think that's been, that's been really great. And I mean, we're, we are so lucky to work on a business in a, in a kind of industry where we can help people, but mm-hmm. still run a good business at the same time. You know, it's been really, really great. And, um, we definitely, Personally, I try to save a lot of the little stories that you get from alumni when they just, they're like, you know what? It's been two years. I just wanted to tell you, you know, I'm on my second job. You know, my salary is tripled from what I did before. And, you know, it's really because of them. It's not because of us. You know, Mm -hmm. we give them that little bit to get started and the right path. But really, it's up to that person's motivation and their desire to change their life. And it's cool that they chose WinCode really to be that, that initial step for them. That is awesome. I, we talked a little bit before we, we started shooting and also you hit on it, you about the importance of incorporating technology into any business, right? Because we're at the, the stage where 
it's almost impossible to say like, oh, I'm in tech. Tech is part of every business. There is a facet of it, right? So can you, you hit on a little bit about, you know, why that's important and how you incorporate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's obviously very, very hard to think of a, a company that's not using technology sure. in some way, you yeah. know, and I think it's one of the things that I see when people talk about maybe Miami or comparing it to different scenes is like, oh, well, you know, we have to attract these top brand tech companies to open up shop here and, right. and start development. Thing. And that's not true. Miami has a lot of companies that are world leading and the technology that they're incorporating is pretty amazing. I mean, you look at companies like Magic Leap or Royal Caribbean has thousands of, of technology jobs. You know, there are these companies that, you know, you might not think like Watsco, which has a right. ventures arm and is building software for different things and they're a publicly traded air conditioning company, you know? So I think we're seeing it happen right in front of us. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people will underestimate, you know, the number of technology jobs that every company has already. But I think what everyone's missing is how much those jobs will grow, you For know, sure. like it's it's only getting started. So this skill set is there's just not enough people being trained in it. And, and all of these companies need those skills. So yeah, as far as opportunity goes, I don't think there's a better one out there. Yeah. And I think, you know, something I say a lot and, uh, you know, Ed has, I did a TEDx talk on hiring tech, tech talent and, and Ed and you uh, helped me with uh, getting, you know, the whole message across. But I mean, every industry is a tech industry, Definitely. right? Yep. Like, uh, but there are a lot of people who don't necessarily subscribe to that. I believe it. And I believe it. Yeah. And I think, um, I think they're either going to get left behind mm -hmm. or be running to catch up. And I think the importance of learning and educating yourself with technology is not, it doesn't always have to be that you're going to be a developer, UX, UI product mm -hmm. designer. It's that you will understand the world you live in today. I think that's really important. I think the language of the world today is very much written in technology. For and sure. so you have to have some understanding of that. And I think in the workplace, like, you know, developers and product designers have a seat at the table now because they're so important to a product or service. 100%. So if you don't understand anything about what they're doing, like, and you're sitting there at that table twiddling your thumbs, like, you're definitely going to become the irrelevant one. Right. So, you know, I, I think it's such an important skill set to have. And then on the flip side, I think why people are tend to be like, oh, I'm not techie. I couldn't learn that. That's too hard. Is, um, you know, in that talk, I talked about, you know, there's a big newspaper and the editor, I gave a talk about similar to this on a panel and they came up to me afterwards and they were like, well, I mean, you just said everyone should learn to code. And I just wanted to say, like, I don't agree with that. Like, why is that? And I think, you know, so we had a good discussion about that, which is exactly what I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But the reason I feel like that person really felt that way is because they couldn't envision themselves as that. They don't feel like they could be right. a developer. They probably thought like, oh my God. Yeah. yeah, it was projecting. Like if I walked in to my office and I was me, I wouldn't hire me, you know? And that's just because they don't think that they can. But right. the truth is today, in addition to this message is anyone can learn to code. Anyone can learn to be a product designer. It's, it's way more accessible than people think. And you know, if it's one thing you do after listening to this, it's like go online and do a free tutorial yeah. or come to a free workshop. It's so important. It'll help you not only be a better business person, but also hire better, understand other people better. It's, you know, as a business person, technologists have taught me so many lessons in how to run a business more efficiently. Mm. I'm really grateful for, you know, learning the way that software teams operate because it, it's also relevant to running a business. For sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, to, to hit on this this uh, newspaper employee that says she wouldn't hire herself if she mm -hmm. walked in, right? We were talking uh, before we started recording also about how hiring tech talent is different than any other talent, right? So she didn't she obviously didn't understand that one key component that mm -hmm. when you're looking at a potential recruit or we're bringing in somebody for tech, you're not looking for someone with necessarily years and years of credentials. I mean, a lot of people could do that, but that could potentially backfire, right? Because you know, you can get great tech talent out of a, a camp like WinCode, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, almost 800 graduates later, I can tell you they're like doing, you know, like our early grads are yep. like all lead engineers now doing incredible things like with big companies like Microsoft and Amazon. So it's not like they can't, you know, play in the big leagues. For sure. And Although and we try to keep everyone in South Florida. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to go on the record here and state that, again, I've hired out of WinCode, yes, you know, you are awesome. multiple times. <laughs> and 
initially, you know, again, as we were learning to build a business and build a software company, a technology company, we were like, let's look for good, good senior devs, right? We want to hire, you know, great talent. We just raised money. The investors want to see us hire good, good tech talent. We came around to hiring win coders. We had some senior devs on the staff. And then we also brought in the junior devs and we were like, okay, we have some senior devs and they can work with the junior devs and that could be like a good match. But right out of the bat, the win code graduates just outworked and out, they shipped more code on a daily and weekly basis than the senior devs. Yeah, they're devs. hungry. They want the experience. That's great it, to hear. It yeah. was amazing. <laughs> and ever since that happened, it was just like you guys were the first place I would go whenever I needed tech talent, right? I would yeah, just go straight awesome. to win code. And uh, I mean, I couldn't be more pleased with the with the talent that came out of WinCode. And I still keep in touch with those people that worked with us today. They're amazing. That's and it's awesome. cool to see how their careers have very yeah, cool. like yeah. Yeah. shot up too. It's it like such great experience what they got with you guys. And, yeah, uh, for sure. Great and shout out to Bianca who's you know starting her own company, right? She 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 was started off at Winco, learned yeah, how Bianca to code. Padilla, yeah. yeah, definitely. She's and so great. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. But I you know, I will also shout this back out to you, yeah. which is we couldn't do it um if it wasn't for the companies that then take on the that are progressive looking at new ways to hire tech talent updating the lenses that they use to identify people because the real learning comes and this whole system works when companies hire junior local talent because the continued mentorship training experience happens on the job mm. so Thank you so much. You sure. have been a big part of our success. Oh, yeah. pleasure is mine. <laughs> I, I've always taken pleasure in betting on people early mm -hmm. and giving them a shot. I think, like you said, they're hungry. You mm -hmm. know, that's so true. And I'd rather have somebody that's less experienced but hungrier than a person that's, you know, super talented but satisfied about just doing the bare minimum and going home, right? That's yeah. that's huge. And I thought that was like the wind coders, they directly contributed to company culture. And a lot of people told me one of the reasons they loved working at Live Ninja w were because of the culture mm -hmm. and how good the culture was. And culture is like this weird thing. You can't really, you know, you ask 10 different people what culture yeah. means and you get 10 different answers. But again, culture was all about trust of the people around you and that the people, like everybody on the team had your back and had your best interest. The wind coders directly contributed to that culture because they would come in early and they would just hustle and hustle, hustle. They'd be one of the last to leave the office. So they were a big contributing factor into creating that culture of trust and, and work ethic and things like that. Yeah, so it's so cool. It's and, super, yeah, yeah I was just going to say like for companies too, to realize that like, you know, it is an investment to bring on somebody junior, you for know, sure. and I think there's a lot of companies that want to take, the shortcut and be like, well, someone else can do that work and I'll just hire them when, once they're already mid-level or senior. Yep. The problem is in technology, there's so much demand that that's not sustainable, yeah. you know? So then the companies just have open job recs that they can never fill. You know, the culture suffers because you're just trying to poach people from other companies. And yep. there's companies that do the junior pathway really well. Like Care Cloud's got over 20 hires from our program over the whole time. And they've really realized that it's like, you need to build that pathway, you know, and give people that kind of, initial responsibility and what you said was awesome in terms of just trusting people and knowing that okay they're going to grow really quickly and they're going to put in that work just give them the chance and that's all we can ask for and and you can see the results of you know where these people are able to go long term and it's not that different from if they had done a four-year computer science degree which is amazing agreed and i think you guys both touched on it but the key i you know there's a few keys but one of the keys that helps unlock the tech hiring door is uh focusing on attributes and quality of work. And so what that really means is a lot of people are filtering out people who don't have computer science degrees and you really don't need a computer science degree to be a great software developer. Right. You probably, you might need it for machine learning or like high, higher level architecture, but for most tech jobs in companies, you don't need a degree. In fact, Apple and Google don't even require it anymore for their technical jobs because everybody is so in need of technology mm. talent and they've recognized this. Yep. Um, so I think, you know, looking at attributes, one of the perfect examples is musicians, athletes, and veterans. They may, they will, they will get filtered out of being considered a software developer, or product designer, but they actually possess really important attributes, which are that they know, uh, discipline and practice will make them good at something. And it's not a deterrent. Mm -hmm. They like the That's challenge part of the process. because they have lived in this world of like, I gotta be, I gotta practice to be good at this craft. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, digital capabilities are also a craft that you have to practice at. And the, the, the number one thing is like, you might look at someone who has amazing credentials. They were like A plus plus, like, you know, top of their class, whatever. But if they have a fixed mindset, mm -hmm. meaning if they don't catch on right away, every failure is going to make them worse and worse instead of better and better. And as a developer, you really need failure to be your motivator. So, you know, that's just an example of like, it's so important. And I think companies are going to be forced to update the lens they use because there just isn't enough tech talent right now. So people are going to be like, okay, we'll, we'll try new things. Like Live Ninja was super open to this and we have companies who are really open to it and they do really well um, from hiring in the program. But there are a lot of companies who definitely push back on what we're saying. You know, it takes them a while to come around. Yeah, and PSA to any company that might be listening to this and, and, and is worried about junior hiring junior talent i feel like the ramp up from a junior dev to shipping the same caliber code as like a senior developer is very very fast mm -hmm. like people join a company and you know if they're they're good and they're committed it's not going to be very long before they're already reaching the same caliber of, of code commitment and shipping the same quality of software that a senior dev would yeah so i feel like it's it's within these companies best interest to start attracting junior devs to their company and nurturing those those players yeah, and you build loyalty for too sure. in a very like fluid labor market right? i would say it's a benefit to, yeah. to bring on junior devs for for that reason well, one of the thing i want to talk to you guys about is is some of the lessons you've learned in building your company um again the lessons that you know we all learned the, the most important ones are through some of the mistakes we've made and kind of trial by error right <laughs> Um, I'd like to talk to you about some of those lessons. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned when building and scaling WinCode? So, uh, you know, things that we've learned in, in growing WinCode is, uh, this is fresh on my mind cause I just talked about it, but you know, it boils down to basically that raising capital is not always, you know, what it's glorified to be a hundred percent. And you know, you want to do it like as a founder when you're building a business and, and we were self-funded for many years. So, you know, we personally had a lot on the line and then you get the, to that stage where there are certain like milestones that are talked about a lot and they're kind of like, you know, hallmarks for like what level of entrepreneur are you? Right, like, right. have you raised money or not? Yeah. Are you at a series A? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And it is, it's exciting and it's a new skill. It's also very distracting. Sure. And, and so we were like, okay, we don't, you know, in addition to making the company successful, another level of stress, if it's self-funded is it's all on you. It's like, if things aren't going well, like what does that mean for you right. and your life and your finances? So we're like, we want to raise money because we want to, you know, say we did it, understand the process and that it's not all on us and also get some great partners who are going to help us really scale and, you know, rocket the company. Right. And so we ended up raising capital, which was awesome. Great process. And we got two term sheets, one from a suite, a group in Sweden who we ultimately signed with and another from a group in Naples. And we met with, you know, a lot of people say like there's not capital i will just say everyone was really accessible we yeah. met with a lot of people we got a lot of great feedback um i think there were a lot of great options but and to that end i mean you're a miami company but you raised from a group in sweden right mm -hmm. a lot of investors and i think it's old school mentality people saying they can't raise money here because they think oh i'm looking for investors in in south florida but these days most investors are location agnostic they yeah. recognize you could build companies anywhere yeah right? totally so I think that was great. So one of the things that ended up happening when we raised money is, uh, you know, they were a 20 year business that, you know, well-known brand in Europe, $400 million, like market cap doing awesome. And so when we were, when we had our first few board meetings, uh, you know, it, it somehow became this like mentor mentee relationship mm -hmm. or like, you know, that they were somehow guiding us. And I personally had this like, wow, like this is so cool. We have such awesome partners, which they totally were. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, they must have better answers than I do right. to the challenges of scaling. And that was definitely a learning because it's, you know, it's so important as a founder to remember that no one knows your business better than you. Right. And so I, I definitely lost sight of that a little bit. And also like no one knows the market better than you or if, if you're keeping up with things it you know that's the scenario you want it to be in and so you know we were not a good marriage in that they were a very big established corporation and we were still a really small scrappy startup and so we tried to implement some of the strategies you would in corporate 
and it just wasn't the right strategy. It wasn't the winning formula. And so the only reason that happened and why I didn't push back is because I was really excited. I'm like, oh, this sound, this all sounds great. Let's try that. But then in hindsight, I was like, man, I knew that wasn't going to work. Why do we do that? Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, biggest lesson for me is one, everyone says this, but really, really think twice about, do you need to raise the capital? If you're raising it, what are you raising it for? Do you need the strategic partnerships or do you need the capital to stay alive? Uh, if it's going to rocket fuel scale, like how is it like have the plan in advance, which, you know, most people do, but then when you put it into practice, that's a whole different thing. And then the other thing is to remember that even when you bring on partners, you are still the leader of the company to not lose sight of that because I definitely did for a minute. I really enjoyed working with them, but, at, but it wasn't the best thing for the company. That's for sure. It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I would add like in terms of the process itself, kind of leading up to it, I think it's very important to have like multiple offers, you for know, sure. that really helped us. And it's something that I picked up in, in college, you know, like the best alternative to your negotiated agreement, like BATNA, it's like this one tidbit that always helps me. If you want to win a negotiation, the only way to do that is to have two offers and you can either play them against each other, or at least, you know, okay, do I want this offer if I, or, or this one, what are the pros and cons of each? And, and I think that's been helpful through a lot of different sort of scenarios and all the way back to the floorball days of trying to figure out how to sort of make big decisions. So, so that was really, really helpful. And I think at the end of the day, looking back on the process, the, it's always very easy to get into a deal, you know, and, and, you know, obviously you have to go through due diligence and, you know, you're pitching and it's amazing. Everyone's super excited. Getting out of a deal is very hard, you know, and, and it took pretty much a year of, of our lives, you know, kind of untangling that and, and figuring it all out. And, um, at the end of the day, we're lucky it worked out really well. And, you know, the company's doing well now we brought in new partners, local partners, and have been able to kind of reset and focus on what we want to do. But there was a risk that the entire company could fail during that process because you're not solely in charge. You know, you have another stakeholder that's sure. allowed to kind of call the shots in a certain way and their motivations may be different and the outcomes that they're willing to accept may be different from the ones you're willing to accept. So it's definitely something that I was taught, you know, when you go into the deal, look at like, okay, what's the worst case and what happens? Yep. Um, but it didn't help. You still didn't think that because you're of so course. excited, of you course. know, so now going into any deal, it is definitely like, okay, what happens if Worst we can't agree? Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's sometimes it's as easy as what if we can't agree? Mm -hmm. What, what actually happens? Right. And in our case, it was a stalemate and that's what made it so tough. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really, it just kind of stalled and, um, it took a long time to figure that out. Yeah. And, and I just say, cause this is reminding me, I said earlier, network is so important. Um, and I, I just want to briefly shout out that, you know, we're both Endeavor entrepreneurs, but we're also part of EO, which is entrepreneur organization. And as it relates to this story is our Endeavor mentors helped us navigate not only the deal, but the untangling, which we had some really great advice there. Um, and then on uh, bringing in new partners, that was from our network and connections through EO. So, you know, I, you know, as much as you can when you're building or doing anything, just like getting out there, getting to know people who for the sure. players are, not only just meeting great people for making an awesome life for yourself, but right. in business, it's it's super helpful. Definitely. And, yeah. and oftentimes you feel like, again, you have this, you know, this this circle that is your company, right? And you're operating within that circle and you have your, your employees and your team and your investors and the board and all that stuff. And it's crazy, but you really need a good surrounding circle outside of that craziness yeah. to help you see like from a top down perspective, what's going on and how to, to navigate that because we could feel so encompassed mm -hmm. with what's happening inside the circle that oftentimes we deprioritize the outward circle mm -hmm. because we're so focused here. Sometimes we need to flip it and we need to be like, okay, guys, I need to take a step back from this craziness. You know, how can you help me look at this in a new way? And I think Endeavor, EO, you know, those type of of groups and networks can be really helpful in that regard. Yeah, so awesome. Yeah, and, and co-working spaces too. We met a lot of people via the lab and, you know, also Miami Angels now, which was AGP in the past. Yeah, for sure. Really interesting. And investors, just to, to kind of piggyback on what you guys were talking about, I mean, I, I think choosing your investor carefully is one of the most important things you could do. Like you guys said, it's really easy to get excited when somebody wants to hand you a million dollars, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. So yeah you, like, forget to, you forget that they're, while they're doing due diligence, I mean, you right. should also 100%. do due diligence. You actually yeah. should be yeah. doing three times the due yes. diligence yes. that they're doing on you, you should do on them. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants to see 
you know, a number and an M next to their name, like so and so raised five million dollars. Yeah, Everybody yeah. wants to see that, right? Mm-hmm. That's a great, you know, great, uh, you know, marker for anybody. But like you just said, if they're doing due, due, due diligence on you, you need to be doing due diligence on them. My God, that that's a tongue twister. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I used to do at Live Ninja, which I thought was super helpful, was you would ask for other companies that the investors used to work with, right? Like, you know, who are some investors, you know, that I can talk to as a referral? Of course, they would give you the the top three of the ones that worked out for them, right? Yeah. But what would be great, I thought, for any entrepreneur to do is to go to that VC's website and to pull up their portfolio mm-hmm. and find three of the companies that failed, yeah. that are not around anymore, and reach out to those three CEOs yeah. and ask them how the investor handled him or herself during those tough times. Mm-hmm. It's a great uh, option. Yeah. yeah, that's the real you know, partner, you know, like they're, they'll show them the, their true selves in that moment where things are not going so well versus like, yeah, the company went 5X and we sold it, you know, to yeah. a strategic acquirer. <laughs> Never really going to be that much drama there, but you really want people that can really help you through the tough times more than anything. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, and board dynamics, like you said, can get tricky. Sometimes, you know, you want to serve the board and you want to appease the board and make sure that things are smooth, but uh, they don't know your business better than you do, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah, serving the board is a great way to put it. And, yeah. and then it can also easily get very distracting in that like at, there was a time where it felt like we were just preparing for every board meeting. Right, exactly. And then I was like, man, I got to like, you know, actually what are, you know, what else are we working on than right. reporting and looking at data? So it's, uh, you know, there's great lessons learned. I wouldn't change it, but definitely i will not forget those lessons because i don't want to repeat it <laughs> for sure for sure um and also it's so quick at a board meeting you, they decide on what metric is important for the next quarter yeah and all of a sudden you're obsessing over this metric because you know you're going to talk about the next board meeting and yeah. that might not be the best thing for the business at that moment right mm-hmm. exactly. yeah i mean we talked with a founder recently who you know i won't say who it is but his his board is really stuck on something, which mm-hmm. is that they don't like that the company is in Miami mm. and the investors are outside of Miami. And so it comes up every single board meeting and the way he deals with it is he's, you know, pro- I don't know how he handles it, but he's like, okay, well, what, what's next on the agenda? Yeah. Cause it's gotten That's to good. the point where like they can't talk about it anymore. So this came from an investor, this quote. So it wasn't entrepreneur driven. This was by an investor that said the board eats what you serve them. Yes. And you need That's to focus on that, right? Like don't worry, don't go to the board being like, what do you, what do you guys want to talk about? Because they'll give you all the stuff that they're thinking about on their agenda, but the board eats what you serve them. You prepare the menu for that board meeting. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought was super helpful for me was before the board meeting, I would actually pre-serve up what I'm about to serve to them on individual calls. So I had mm. three other board members. I would just quickly be like, listen, I want to just touch base with you for 10 minutes before the board meeting just real quick on your way home give me a buzz and i'll run through very quickly high level agenda of what the board packet was and this was all stuff that i wanted to cover not stuff they wanted to cover but what that did was it it preconditioned them for the topic so that when a topic came up in the board meeting i had an ally yeah i had somebody that oh yeah i spoke with will about this and what we think we're going to do is x y and z yeah. right and that that made a big difference that's great yeah yeah we should have talked to you before <laughs> Um, cool. So what, what's next for WinCode? What's coming up on the docket? So we've been uh, working a lot on the on the talent side to mm-hmm. really figure out how we can help companies grow. That's yeah, win, what win talent's a whole other division. Right? Win talent's a whole other division, and basically what it is is we realize that there's so much value in our graduate network. You know, it's it's nearly 800 people. Yep. There's people with over five years of experience. And companies would always come to us and be like, "Well, we'd hire more juniors if we could only find some more mid-level or senior folks. Could you help us?" And Certainly we try to help them, but it was not our core business, you know, and that's a very different business from what we were doing. Um, so we started initially thanks to our, our, our investors at the time, but also some of the individuals who've joined our team since then to really look at like, is there a kind of a consulting and staffing component that we can build uh, in our business? And and we've done that now. So we have um, uh, actually over 30 clients that, that we have contracts with here in, in South Florida, uh, mostly where what we can do is, find the specific profile, whether it's a web developer or a digital designer, the right amount of experience. And then we go to our network and look at the candidates that fit that. And many times they're passive. So they're not people who are looking, but because they know us and we train them, we have a great relationship with them and we can talk to them about the opportunity. 
we're very careful not to poach from hiring partners because they they really help us. So if it's a company we work with actively, we, we respect that. But there are a lot of people who are at that stage in their career where they're just ready to make a move and, you know, they might not be looking yet. And I think that's where we can play a really, uh, really interesting role. And uh, and it's been really fun, like to see graduates who graduated three years ago and they're like, I never thought that that tuition that I paid you guys three years ago was going to help me land a hundred fifty thousand dollar job three years later because yeah. you teed it up for me. Amazing. You know, and it's really great. And then we get compensated from the company. So it's a win win for us, too. We're kind of building another stream of revenue, but it's all candidate first. So we're all doing it based on what the individual is looking for and, and, and what they need. So so it's been really interesting. It's a difficult business. Staffing is a whole other world. Yeah. Uh, but I think we're learning how we can be different and really leverage the asset we have, which is which is our awesome graduates. Awesome. Anything else that's coming up that you want to? Yeah, I'd say the wind talent side is is really big. Um, you know, remaining committed to quality education because mm -hmm. that's so important to have the ROI that we're having out yep. of the programs. And, uh, you know, I'd say on the education piece and on the talent piece, it, uh, you know, we're, we're learning about ways to be different. But I, al you know, I can already feel it that we're different, especially on the staffing side. Because for us, of course, there's that like business motivation, like people get placed or they hire consultants that equals revenue, right? That's yep. simple. But beyond that, I mean, we made a gamble on South Florida, right? Like that this is our bet and this is our home and we want to make it awesome. And I know that one of the big blockers for companies that have big tech teams is talent. And mm -hmm. I really think there's that, you know, great opportunities for helping solve it right here locally. And so I'm excited, very excited to be part of that discussion, conversation, helping those companies. It's, it's really cool. So I think that's, you know, that's going to be the key thing. And then of course, naturally the thing we're always looking at is what are the other technologies we're going to teach? What are new programs? Right. Where is the market going? Right. What are people using? New languages that come exactly. out. Exactly. Languages and frameworks. So I think, um, you know, there, that's also really exciting and it's, Miami isn't on the bleeding edge of technology always, but you know, there are a lot of companies here that are doing a lot of really cool stuff. So there's options for lots of stuff. For sure. Yeah. For sure. All right. To wrap it up, if there's somebody listening or watching this podcast that's on the fence, they're thinking about a career move, they want to break into tech, but they just don't know how to make that jump. Can you tell them a little bit about why WinCode might be an option and some of the, you know, the different programs you guys have? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we do our core programs are full time. So it's basically to help people make that career switch. And mm -hmm. to do that, you need to put in the time. So yeah. it's a 10 week full time program. It means leaving your job, whatever you're currently doing and focusing on nothing else. And that's where the true power comes from. You're just surrounded by people doing the same thing as you and experts in the field for such a long, intense period that you're job ready in a much shorter period than in traditional education mm -hmm. where you're only doing a few hours. So, um, but we also realize it's a big decision. Nobody just jumps from hearing a podcast and being like, oh, I'll sign up tomorrow. You know, of course. it really is about getting to know us, getting to understand what the opportunities are. Many times speaking with alumni or hiring partners to realize that it's really possible. So we love hosting events. We have events pretty much every week on campus in, in Wynwood. So I would say if you're curious and just want to find out more, the best thing to do is go on our site. It's wincode.co slash events and just see what events are going on. Sign up, come check it out. There's probably pizza and beer. It's going to be fun. You know, you can meet some other people probably in a similar mindset as you and and just get to realize that regardless of what your background is, it doesn't dictate your future. You can create your future. And if you have motivation and you like problem solving, like this is a field that you can be very, very successful in. So um, and we also offer part time programs. So those aren't focused as much on career change. But if you want to level up at work or maybe you're entrepreneurial and you want to understand how to build a basic app or maybe manage uh, a developer somewhere, those courses are in the evening. So we do we do that as well as digital marketing. So um, we're really excited about those. And something new we're doing um, starting in 2020 officially is we're going to have a co-working element for only for technologists. So it's something different. No one's really doing it where the vetting is that it's either web developers or digital designers. And we're, we got this request from alumni that basically so many people as they progress in their careers work remotely mm -hmm. and remote work is cool, but it's lonely. Yep. So we want to have a space where anyone who's working in technology can come in and be surrounded by the excitement of WinCode, which is a lot of people wanting to learn and super motivated, great guest speakers, awesome instructors, and just make that your workspace whenever you 
don't want to be at home. Um, sure. So we invite, and it's not just for WinCode grads. So anyone listening who works in technology, we invite them to check that out and we'd love to have them as part of the, the ecosystem. And I love the, the, the campus is awesome. The new campus you guys have in the yeah, middle of Wynwood. I mean, the location can't be beat. So definitely come check them out. I mean, you know, I've, I've been there multiple times. It's a warm place. It feels like just like kind of like a second home in the mm-hmm. middle of Wynwood every time I visit you guys. So if anybody listening, watching that's on the fence, definitely check out WinCode. We'll drop all your information in the description of the podcast so they can contact you. And uh, yeah, guys, I really appreciate you being here and Yay. love this conversation. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for being here. This is great, great studio. Thank you. Take care, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.